Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Cambridge A5 amplifier and this unit is the version 1 so the first production type. So in terms of general specifications your power output here is RMS 60 watts into 2 times 8 ohm speakers and as is common at this sort of era of amplifier it also supported by wire which is extremely popular and there are still amplifiers out there you know even today which are provided to have by wiring connection of speakers and then input sensitivity uh, you're looking at the phono input and this is an optional but this amplifier did have the board installed as you'll see later and that for the moving magnet type cartridge is 1.75 millivolts into a 47 k ohm load and then for your other inputs, which is MD stroke tuner, CD, AV and AUX, it's 250 millivolts. And the amplifier also supports a pre-amplification output, and that is a maximum of 500 millivolts. And then in terms of frequency response, you're looking at 10 hertz to 60 kilohertz with a minus 3 dB points. And distortion is less than 0.02% at 1 watt. And then overall dimensions, height is 90 millimeters with a width of 430, um, depth coming in at 300 millimeters, and then weight 6.2 kilograms. Now, this series of amplifiers is extremely popular, and again, you can purchase these via auction websites. What I would say is I've literally repaired hundreds of these amplifiers over the time, and they have particular issues that are common. Um, but a couple of those issues we'll sort of talk about now. Uh, the first one is not super common, but the second one I would say is more so. So really what was the issue with the amplifier when it came into the workshop? Well, the first point was that the amplifier did not power up. And what I'm showing now is the power input fuse, and that fuse um, literally had evaporated so there was that much current which had been drawn so not evaporated sorry vaporized that it was obliterated now that fuse is f101 and it's actually uh, on the front tone control board when you look from the top left hand side you can see where the wires come in off the toroidal transformer and there is a protective cover over the fuse and it's rated at 230 volts it is time delay 2 amp. If you have a unit which is running from 115 volts then that fuse rating will double to 4 amps. Now when you sort of get that problem and you see this vaporized fuse you know that that is a severe amount of current which has been drawn and the most common issue to cause that is normally either an issue maybe the output transistors have failed in the amplifier or there are shorted turns on the primary of the transformer. So it's very, very easy to sort of fault find, you know, where the issue is. What you have on the amp board are two fuses, which are T4 amp, time delay, and they are on the secondary of the toroidal transformer. If you just lift them out, then you've isolated, of course, the amp board. So to all intents and purposes, the transformer would be offload and should not be drawing any high current and then what I do and again I'll put a link in the description for the video I just power it up via a dim bulb tester now what was interesting is that when I powered it up the bulb did not light brightly so you'd first think hmm hang on a minute you know there must be a fault on the amp board but because the fuses have been removed all I'm simply doing is I just put the meter onto AC and then I'm just measuring to see if there's any output from the toroidal and there wasn't. So that meant that the shorty turns, of course, had occurred. And then eventually the wire must have gone open circuit. So after removing the AC mains input, I simply put the multimeter onto resistance and then measure across the primary of the transformer and it was open circuit. So that from an initial sort of fault finding and repair point of view is very, very easy to, to fix. So, of course, replace the T2 amp fuse and then what I do is I have in stock a replacement 150 VA transformer. So depending on your, your, your primary, you know, whichever region you're located in, just make sure that matches. And then the secondary winding is 30 volts dash 0 dash 30. 
and that is a common tight transformer so here I have them made and are in stock but you wouldn't have any difficulty trying to source that transformer it is very very common so dead easy to remove the toroidal you have a fixing bolt that comes through underneath via the bottom plate and then in place you have an anti-slip washer standard washer and then the locking nut once you take out the toroidal, you'll see that there's a small skid plate underneath, rubber skid plate. Just pop the transformer onto there. And then you'll have like this plate mechanism, which has the sticker on there for the Cambridge Audio. When you put that on in place, just ensure that you don't over tighten the locking nut when you reinstall the transformer. You know, these things just must be held firm. But if you over tighten, you don't want to crack the enamel on the insulating wire on the transformer because then you're going to have shorted turns again so firm position but nothing more and then it's a case of removing the input selector knob and what you'll find is two screws there so undo them and then left and right you have force fixing screws and then the bottom you have four fixing screws as well what you'll be able to do is release the three fixing screws for the tone control board stroke power input side of the board and then you can just raise it up and it's dead easy then to resolder your new wires from your toroidal onto the input for the main supply and then also onto the amplifier board. So once that was then complete, of course, I could just power it up via the dim bulb tester, which I did initially and the amplifier was fine and then it came on. But as I'm showing in the video, it was clear that this amplifier must have been repaired at some time in the past. And the thing that sort of gives it away is that one of the preset trimmers is not per the original. Now, these are 100 ohm bias trimmers, and you can see that the two don't match. They should be these small uh, black trimmers, but th this one had been replaced. So just to keep originality to it, and also as well, the trimmer which had not been replaced was a little bit crusty. So I'm thinking, yeah, let's take that out at the same time. So I've replaced both of the presets. And then when I've turned the board over and I'm showing this again, what you'll find is that often you'll find multiple joint dry, dry joints, particularly on the voltage regulators and then also on some of the pre-driver and voltage transistors. So just look at that board and then reflow. And then what I also found was some of the component leads for the repair channel hadn't been cut down, you know, flush to the board or flush to the solder connection. And they're kind of waving around in the air. So I just took care of all of that. And then also as well, just use some deflux just to get rid of any sort of uh, excess flux away from there. And then once that was done, again, what I now show is the top of the circuit board. And lo and behold, what you find is this brown glue. And we've spoken about this many, many times. So they used a brown glue or sorry, a glue originally to hold up or to extra support for larger components like capacitors. But rather than carefully put it in during manufacture, they kind of covered components. And then this stuff dries out, it becomes very hard, and then it becomes conductive and also corrosive. So what I've done is I've taken the time just to remove that brown glue and be very, very careful. Use a plastic scraping tool, but make sure that you use eye protection. Don't even think, well, I'll try and do it, it'll be okay. Because I'll guarantee it will flick up and then it's going to go into your eye. So... As I said before, don't do that. So once that is then done, the next part that I'm concentrating on is the output transistors. And these are the Sankin type devices. Um, in terms of design, I figure what happened was when these amplifiers, in terms of, of the circuit board tracks, the quality of the circuit boards, it was probably earmarked to provide less output power than what it was actually sold to do because the circuit board is probably not the best design particularly the circuit circuit tracks as well so you have to be careful when you sort of desolder and then soldering back in replacement parts but when you look at the heat sink it, it kind of is underrated you know what you're sort of expecting that sort of small heat sink to do yeah it's kind of stretching it a bit so over time what you'll find is that the thermal transfer heat sink compound will dry out and it becomes almost a powder so it has no thermal conductivity whatsoever and that means that those output transistors are working harder than what they should so what I show and I did this for each one of the output transistors I just simply removed the locking nut at the rear or underneath 
and then just raise up each power output transistor and then I'll reapply new thermal conductive compound both onto the heatsink where the micro washer fits and then of course onto the rear of the output transistors and then bolt them back in place. So of course it will give you to a large degree thermal uniformity but also as well you're making sure that the maximum amount of heat can be transferred away from the transistor onto the heat sink and it may well be that you know the the most common failure with these amplifiers is either the left or the right channel output transistors fail it could be associated with the amplifiers being run hard but also that the thermal compound you know just isn't is ineffective but i kind of figure it's a little bit being overdriven per underrated design there so once those output transistors are all bolted down and again be aware that these transistors are obsolete now the sanking ones so these are sanking sap n npn device or p pmp devices but you may be able to source ones which are p o n o or p y n y but you know they're, they're compatible so Try and source, if you can, genuine originals, or if you can't, try and find pulled genuine originals. Because there are, like all electronic components now, counterfeits out there, which seem to be looking the same, but electronically, electrically, they are completely different. They've just been re-etched. And then once that work had been done, what sort of remains? Well, we'd taken care of all the dry joints, we'd replaced the trimmers, and of course renewed the thermal transfer compound. The next part was to power up the amplifier and again I do this via the dimble tester and then what I show you here is the uh, circuit schematic for the output stage and this is the left channel and you can see on the right hand side I've just extracted from the technical data sheet for the Sankin 15N and P transistors so what it denotes are the pins that you need to connect your multimeter across and I'll show this later in the video um, what you are doing here is you are measuring the millivoltage across the internal emitter resistor within the device and um, what you're looking to do is to adjust the preset value in this case for the left channel I'm saying RVT201 and I adjust it initially to about sort of 10 or 11 millivolts and then what I'll then do is leave the amplifier, you know, sort of running for about 15, 20 minutes. And then I'll put it over onto full power, i.e. not via the dimble tester. And then I'll do the slight adjustment then to bring it up in line to 13 millivolts as shown. And I do that for both of the channels. Now you should find that these trimmers sit just off sort of left or right of midpoint position. If it's right the way down to the minimum or to the maximum, then that tends to indicate that maybe you've got an additional issue and you need to sort of fault find that. Now remember that this amplifier doesn't have a speaker protection relay. This is not like some of the Cambridge amplifiers that do. So you need to verify on the rear terminals what is the DC offset. If you have very, very high DC offset, what you need to do is you need to be concentrating at the input stage of the amplifier and around um, the input transistors which are Q204 and Q203. Those long tail pair and the transistors beneath them, if they start to drift or they go out of spec, that normally will create a DC offset, quite a high DC offset. So don't look at the output transistors, just do a block change. You're not going to read it on, you know, sort of a meter, just block change them out. And then you should find that any high DC offset will quickly drop down when you repower up probably to about three maybe eight millivolts but nothing higher than that now this isn't a typo error that you see where i say cambridge a500 left channel circuit you will not find a circuit diagram or service manual for the a5 but what you can use is the a500 circuit schematics which is available and good for fault finding but just be aware on the amplifier board there are some resistor values which are slightly different to the A500 than what is then used on the A5. Okay, so just be aware of that. So once that was all done, the next part, of course, is to make sure that the user controls are noise free. So that's very straightforward. You just simply spray into their high quality contact cleaner like Deoxid and then just work the potentiometers backwards and forwards multiple times. 
and if you've got your speakers connected you may hear some form of scratchy noise or maybe a little bit of a popping noise but you know let, let it do its work and then recheck and if you apply any more or you need to apply any more by all means until they are completely noise free uh, sometimes you may also get the situation where sometimes the potentiometers are stiff to turn because the original lubricating grease has dried out but normally working the potentiometers back and forth will you know quickly quickly free that so for this amplifier really twofold and again sort of what i'm showing you here is the toroidal transformer which of course had the open circuit primary and then i'm also showing you the input protection fuse but again referencing back to the a500 it's the same for the uh, the a5 so that really brings us to an end for this repair tutorial so again good insight for yourselves if you're going to undertake any repairs of this series uh, bear in mind that you can apply this also uh, to the a300 amplifier and then a500 and then also the a4 a5 okay all right so i wish you all the best and appreciate your time until the next repair video tutorial if you need any help email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com and bye bye